Zo, goedemorgen allemaal. Leuk dat jullie er allemaal zijn zo vroeg. Dit tijdstip al. Top. Um, so you had four days to make some Dutch friends. I hope you understand Dutch. It will all be in Dutch. So, just kidding. So, great that you showed up in this amount, uh, this morning, at this, uh, this time. For some reason, I always seem to attract less people than Dries or Corey does. Anyway, um, Holly asked me to, uh, to do some, uh, to tell you a little bit about the Dutch Drupal community and also tell you the housekeeping rules for those who just had a day pass and are here just for today. My name is Baris Wanschus, also known as Baris W. I'm the chair of the Dutch Drupal Foundation. Um, so let's start with the housekeeping rules. There's Wi-Fi, this is the password. Um, please only connect one device at a time and don't set up some local networks. It might uh, crash the Wi-Fi. About the food, uh, let the vegans eat. There is a special diet corner for those people. Don't take their diets because they'll be hungry and that's a shame. So that's boffs. Birth of a Federal session. These are not presentations. There's not uh, PowerPoint slides or whatnot. It's just a place that you come together, you share knowledge. Uh, there's a schedule online and you can uh, add your own uh, boffs today. There's social events. We've had a, a few in the last uh, couple of nights. I hope you have fun. Uh, tonight there will be the quiz night, which is amazing. It's in the Panama Club, Club Panama. It's about a 15 minute walk from the central station or you can take a tram, it takes you about uh, five minutes. Uh, the quiz night, I think it's one of the most amazing events and you have to be there if you didn't go there before. Doors open at eight. Um, oh, and I forgot one thing. If you have sponsored gift packs for the quiz night, uh, hand them in please in packages of five uh, at the reception desk. We can use some fun prizes and I'm not talking about t-shirts. Social media, there is the DrupalCon Europe account, which I, I'm the one who runs the account for the last couple of months. If you have questions about that, please do not hesitate to contact me afterwards. There's the hashtags DrupalCon, Drupal Sprint, Drupal Radio, and we're all using them to uh, make this event better. There it goes. So we need pictures, don't keep the photos for yourself. If you have pictures, please put them in the, um, upload them to the Flickr group. Uh, we. We need all of them, so please do. If you have them, don't keep them for yourself. Then there's the session recordings. You might have noticed they are blazingly fast here at DrupalCon. It's about, it takes an hour or so after each session to put them online. So all sessions of yesterday and the day before are already online. Uh, there's a YouTube channel and this links, link takes you to, to it. And there's sprints. Like last weekend we had sprints in the Burs of Berlage. Uh, next weekend there will be sprints as well. It's free to attend, you don't need a ticket to get there. This Friday, there will be a sprint as well. It's the main sprint. It's about a few hundred people in a room working on Drupal Core, Drupal Contrib. There's mentors to help you if you are new. If you have never worked with code before, you are really valuable to help writing documentation, to test patches, and as mentors to help you set up your environment. So please go there. It's really fun and you learn a lot. Keep in mind, it's the E entrance, so not, not the entrance that you've took uh, today. It's in the Ruby Lounge, in the Forum Lounge. Uh, and there's more info about the sprints in the Mentors booth at 4.15. So all about the store. There is a, a store with, with goodies and fun stuff. Uh, it's in the lunch area. Get there before after lunch, before lunch ends, else the store might close. We close it. Uh, we don't let it open until the end of the day. All right. So what did you think about the sessions? Please help us make DrupalCon better. Evaluate sessions. It takes a minute of your time. Uh, Every session page has a link to evaluate it and the link will be posted when the session is over. So go there, uh, help speakers to get better. So then a few words about the local community. Um, our local foundation, it's called Stichting Drupal Nederland. Try to pronounce it, it's fun. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, have a fund we are a foundation, we are run by seven volunteers. I'm the chair, there's six others. And the foundation helps growing Drupal in the Netherlands by enabling the community to share the knowledge at events and online. We are funded by the sponsors of our events and we have a partner program just like the Drupal Association with organization partners and individual partners. Uh, and these amazing partners help us to fund all the events that we do. Um, for each event that we organize, we form s uh, small groups, about five or six people uh, of volunteers and each group uh, has one board member of the foundation in the team. Well, some of the events that we organize are uh, the Drupal Jam, which is, uh, I think, the oldest event that we organize. We do this for about nine years now. 
It's the biggest yearly Drupal event in the Netherlands, uh, about three to 400 attendees. This is last year, uh, Dries was uh, live on Skype to chat with the audience. And it's comparable with DrupalCon. There's like tracks and sessions, uh, and it's sponsored by several companies as well. So this is the event I'm really excited about. This, um, this is the Drupal training day to answer the large demand for Drupal uh, currently in the Netherlands, and we, we think it's going to be even, even more after DrupalCon. So, um, so to, to answer for that demand, we organized a, tr a free training day for students uh, all over the Netherlands and, and Belgium to come to Amsterdam and to get a free Drupal training for a day. So we aimed for about 30 to 40 students, and we ended up with 250 students and 35 volunteers. One day, one place, it was amazing. And we believe with even 80 people on the waiting list that we organized the largest Drupal training worldwide ever. So. Thank you. We shared our knowledge and how we've set this training up um, and all the learnings that we gained. We did that last Monday on the Community Summit. And we will also do it again at Drupal Camp Ghent. So if you go there, you can learn how we set this up. We will share all the virtual box images that we've made and all the knowledge that we gained uh, all the trainings that we did. And we decided to make this a yearly event now, so it will be there next year, and we aim to even, uh, even make it bigger. We're aiming for about 500 students next year. So another new event this year that we organized is the Splash Awards, which is kind of like the Blue Drop Awards, for those who know it. It's like a, um, an, an event, awards event, so the best website, the best module, the best team. Uh, we have several categories, government, community, modules, code, its website, splashawards.org, went live this morning. So go there uh, if, you, if you're curious about the event. We will reach out to Dutch and Flemish companies in the next couple of weeks. And finally, and here I'm the most proud of, I guess, it's uh, DrupalCon Amsterdam. As owner of an Amsterdam-based uh, Drupal agency uh, and being the chair of the Dutch Drupal Foundation, you can imagine that I was quite thrilled to hear that DrupalCon went to Amsterdam. So uh, the Drupal Association contacted me a few, mo few months before DrupalCon, um, sorry, before DrupalCon Prague, uh, and to tell me that, well, it's going to be in Amsterdam, and please get up on, get up on stage. So I did with Bert Boeland and Roy Scholten, also known as Joroy, to, to announce that it will be here in Amsterdam. And they also asked us to make, to help making DrupalCon rock. You know, not, not, not just be it an ev event, but also add some more, make it, make it local, make it Amsterdam. So yeah, we did, we went up stage, we talked about, for, for, for fun, just, oh, why not take a bike and uh, bike to Amsterdam? You can do that. Well, and that turned out into the, uh, what's it called? The Tour de Drupal, isn't that fun? And we also uh, w announced that it would be the best DrupalCon ever. And I believe that we succeeded, but it's up to you to decide. And I'd like to share a bit of the process on how we managed to get there. So about six months ago, in March, we organized the first meeting in the Parab Brewery. We have been there maybe yesterday and the day before uh, with, the, with the logo that looks like the Drupalcon. And uh, Stephanie and Morton came up uh, as members of the Drupal Association to, to get to know the local community and to tell them what they were hoping that we could, uh, could do here. So we, this was the first meeting. We continued this meeting like every month at one of the Amsterdam-based companies. Uh, they sponsored food and, and, uh, and drinks, the, the companies. Uh, and for the last six weeks, we switched to a weekly Skype call. And uh, we helped the DA with providing information about event uh, locations, about bike rental, about uh, transport passes, and how to, to include those in the um, uh, registration form. Um, also, we organized a lot of events here, social events. So one of them is the tour de, uh, arrival of the Tour de Drupal in the Fondel Park last Sunday. I'm not, I'm not sure how many of you went there. There were about 100 people who showed up. Um, so we made a finish line, and this is the group of, of bikers who, who biked all the way to Amsterdam from uh, England, from Ireland, from Belgium, from Switzerland. They all came on the bike. Some took four days to get here. Isn't that amazing? And it was like drinks, and it was food for free, all sponsored by uh, the local foundation. And we also organized the pub crawl. <laughs> Thanks. So we organized the pub crawl on Tuesday. There were like three major pubs, uh, smaller pubs as well. In the Blue Light District, there were three boats that you can join for free. Uh, probably a lot of you did. We had even we had one boat with live musicians on board. So we got some street musicians. So join us, go on board. And they did, so it was fun. Uh, also, we organized yesterday's cultural night. 
the free entrance to museums, live music in the Prow Brewery. It was fun. I thought it was fun. So uh, I hope you had fun too. Uh, but we needed budget to fund all this. And how do we did it? So um, what we did is that we approached about 20 companies and we asked them one question. Would you, would you please chip in 250 euros? And then you can help make DrupalCon rock. There's no like a gold option, silver options, bronze options. There's just one budget, 250 each, but 20 companies paying 250 with a 5,000 euro budget to fund all these events. And we promised them a nice map with their logos on. Uh, and this was a killer selling feature for us. So I'm pretty sure that you've all used this map the whole week uh, uh, very extensively for the last few days. So before I conclude, I want to thank the local team for doing an amazing job. Uh, it was fantastic. This is not even a complete, complete team. We are like with 15 people. And I hope that we've raised the bar for the next DrupalCon country, wherever that may be. I challenge them to raise the bar, to even make it better, to beat us. So uh, come to the closing sessions at 3.30 to find out where the ne next DrupalCon will be. Uh, it's going to be fun as well, I guess. So I'm really proud of what we achieved the past months, not only with DrupalCon, also with the other events that we organize. Um, and I want to thank all the volunteers, all the sponsors, all our partners who make this happen. Um, so can I get a warm applause for those who did this? <laughs> all right, so that was my talk. We continue with the lightning talks. They are hosted by Schnitzel. You might know him as Michael Schmidt. Thanks for the attention and have a great DrupalCon day. Thanks, Paris. Good morning. It's Thursday already. How fast that goes. So, um, lightning talks. Let me shortly introduce what we're doing. Um, as you know, there are sessions. They're one hour long. People present a really long talk for them. They prepare them, they give them, um, and it's mostly one-way discussions. Then we have buffs, which are multiple people talking together. But did you ever had that small idea, maybe on a shower, while you were cycling here, that idea that you really wanted to get out, but you don't really have time to give a session, or you don't have time to prepare a session because it wouldn't fill a whole hour. But you also don't know if anybody is interested in that because it's only your small idea. That's what Lightning Talks are for. So Lightning Talks are already used by other conferences and the track chairs um, of DrupalCon Amsterdam said, okay, let's try them. Let's try them out and see if they work for DrupalCon as well. And we really believe that we have some really great ideas in the community. So we give people the stage here for five minutes to present their lightning talks, their idea they have. And we did that actually last week. So they did not have like the others um, multiple weeks or so to prepare. It's really in a short notice. And I heard even some people stayed up really late to prepare them. So that's cool. So we found seven speakers that said, okay, I want to give something. I want to tell you something, an idea that I had. And I use max five minutes for that. And I will actually make sure that they stop after five minutes. There is a re really big red clock in front of me right now, which says 500. And it will start running whenever the people come up. So we're going to try that out. And if we all like it, we'll see. We do it more at DrupalCons. So we are ready for the first speaker. It's um, Jonathan, and he will talk us about Bitcoin. Okay, hello. Um, so I've been using Drupal for um, six or seven years, uh, but I've discovered something new. It's called Bitcoin, and I'm very excited about it. Um, so what, what makes Bitcoin different compared to uh, a regular uh, bank transfer or PayPal? Well, it's got this invention called the blockchain. But what is the blockchain? Well, it is a shared autonomous ledger. Uh, what this means is that whenever you make a Bitcoin transaction, you have total confidence that it will go through. Um, no one can step in and say, well, you can't send money to that country or you're on PayPal and they don't like the look of one of your transactions, it'll just happen by itself. It's a means for consensus to be reached among peers about what happens in the past. So because there's no authority, um, how do you decide uh, you know, what happened, who sent money to who? And that's a very difficult problem. Uh, so it orders the transactions and this avoids the double spending problem. What happens if I send 
Bitcoin to one person and then I send the same Bitcoin to another person, uh, which, which transaction is the valid transaction? So with the blockchain, it orders the transactions and if, if uh, some Bitcoins are spent in one transaction, a subsequent transaction can't spend the same Bitcoins. But uh, this is a really powerful technology, but uh, Bitcoin is just one implementation. You can actually, you can do a lot of things with the blockchain. And pretty much everything we do on the web at the moment will actually work better uh, if, it's, if it's implemented on a blockchain. So I've got a few examples. Uh, Git, for example, there, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of parallels between Git and, uh, and, and the blockchain. Um, but with Git, you have to uh, always push to a centralized server. If Git was implemented on a blockchain, it would just be, uh, you would just push, you would broadcast your transaction. You wouldn't have to talk to a specific server. So there's no downtime. And there's actually a project called GitChain. I think they're trying to implement this. Twitter, um, sometimes there's censorship on Twitter. People aren't happy about that if they're in certain countries. So there's a project called Twister, which is Twitter implemented on a blockchain. Same with WhatsApp. Um, maybe you're happy with, with WhatsApp and Facebook chat and Google chat. But in theory, this could also be implemented on a blockchain. And there's a project called BitMessage that does this. So this can be highly secure, uh, no, no downtime, no censorship. DNS, uh, in theory, this could be implemented on a blockchain. And there's a technology called Namecoin that, that does this. Um, so it's, uh, it, it could be quite a, a big political step if we replace DNS with, with blockchain. But it's, it's a possibility. And asset trading, uh, with some of these technologies, uh, colored coins, counterparty, master coin, you can issue coins um, and then have people trade them. And this is actually going to be a big deal in the crowdfunding industry. It's going to rev revolutionize it. Um, elections are also uh, a good use for blockchains. It's really hard to do e-voting, but with block blockchain te technology, this is actually achievable. And contracts, um, you know, let's say uh, uh, you want to get married. You can just write your contract and publish it on the blockchain, and then anyone can see that. It can have a timestamp. So you've got proof that a contract was agreed at a certain point of time. And in fact, uh, with a project called Ethereum, you can implement anything on a blockchain. Uh, there's a programming language built into Ethereum. And all of these platforms we use, uh, someone has executive authority and can say what happens on the platforms. But if we, if we rebuild these platforms on a blockchain, then uh, we've got total control. We, we can do what we want. So I've got one minute left. I can tell you about my project called Cointools on Drupal.org. So I'm interested in Bitcoin Drupal integration. So I've made some widgets for Bitcoin for an address and amount to transaction. Some formatters. There's a transaction browser. You can send your Bitcoin. You can receive your Bitcoin. And you can pull in the exchange rates so that you can render your, uh, your Bitcoin with, uh, with the fiat amount. So Drupal 8 is going to be a great platform for startups, I believe. Um, I wanted to make it the best platform for Bitcoin startups because uh, Bitcoin is the is the the new web. So um, that's all I've got to say. So thank you very much. It's okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. So Bitcoin and money. Next one has also to do with money. I think it's a bit different. We'll have Steve talking about the unforeseen. Thanks to the Drupal Association for the vodka. Much appreciated. So I'm Steve Parks from uh, Wonderkraut. Um, and I run the UK office uh, for us. But I also do a lot of coaching with our clients on projects, how they can improve projects. And today I specifically want to talk about project risk, the unforeseen. Has anyone 
ever had anything unforeseen happen on a project that they were doing? Anything crop up last minute? Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? It happens. But large organizations are terrified of risk. They're terrified of the unforeseen. They're terrified of things derailing their projects. It all tends to come from some previous uh, project that went terribly wrong. There is some mythical project in their history that is like, don't mention the project, Project X. And it's scarred them for life. And what happens is that their procurement departments, their legal teams, they put in place lots and lots of rules to prevent similar things happening again. That's it. Put that in the contract. That'll protect us with all our future projects. Suddenly, we are safe. And these rules build up, and they build up, and they become more and more petty all the time. <laughs> Contracts fill up with these tiny little rules, and contracts become huge stacks of documents. Is that projecting the, protecting the projects? No, it's not. Because what happens, the only way to get things done when there are this many rules is the mavericks, the people in the organization that will just push things, do things under the radar. Have you ever had product owners or clients work under the radar in the organization, not tell the stakeholders? And that's not good for projects either. But worse for projects is the idea of those people that stick to the rules. And they stick to the rules a little bit too far. Because you end up with all these petty rules and suddenly everything grinds to a halt. A rule that's designed to stop cars stops the pedestrian. And it gets crazy like that. But then you have the organizational enforcers that come in. And they, their job is to make sure that every single rule is enforced completely. <laughs> And they bring the organization and the projects to a standstill. Let's, uh, but still, you end up with all these rules, all this craziness, all this trying to manage risk by putting everything, locking everything down. Let me take you to Wales. Uh, Wales obviously has the language Welsh. It's a minority language spoken by uh, a relatively small percentage of the population. The Welsh government's trying to promote it. And of course, government procurement as it is, everything's got very strict rules. Their road signs department uh, obviously doesn't have many, well, any Welsh speakers because what they need to do is email off a translation. And obviously, they've done the procurement, they've got the huge contract, they've managed the risk. So they email off a translation. They send off Welcome to Wales by email, and back by email comes the translation, and they put it on the bottom of the road sign. So this road sign in Welsh says, I'm out of the office at the moment, but I'll reply to your translation request in the morning. <laughs> So no matter how many rules you put in place, how many detailed contracts, things will always go wrong. But the warnings get more and more intense, more and more crazy. Everything tries to be protected by the procurement departments. But something's missing. There's this huge gaping void of trust. Trust is what makes projects work. Trust is what makes teams able to collaborate together effectively, not the rules. Let's move beyond rules to a position of trust. But as agencies, we have to earn that trust. First of all, that means we have to use experienced people, good quality staff who are well trained. They've got the professional uh, development that's continuously ongoing. We're not just, you know, uh, offshoring it. We're not just using kids straight out of school, university without training and just billing them out a lot. You've got to have the right staff. And uh, you've also got to have the right tools. And it doesn't mean no planning. These guys were hired to stop cars from parking in that space there. And they put up the bullards. Can you see the lack of planning? Very entertaining watching them at the end of the day. You also have to bear in mind uh, the user and what they actually want, because the contract can't predict that. And the key thing for trust, transparency. If everything is going to be visible that happens on the project, what people do, then suddenly it becomes uh, a lot easier. And you have to live this as well. <laughs> You can't just say, yes, we run projects in this way, and it's full of trust, and we do all these fantastic things. Live the way that you believe in. And that means not taking no risk. It means there is risk on projects. We have to accept that there is risk on projects. And we have to go in there bravely with the right training, the right tools, and go and get our cheese. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Next one up, completely different topic, but definitely interesting as well. We have Alech telling us about Drupet. 
if I say that right. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Alech, and I'm going to make your life a bit easier. So, uh, currently, we have a lot of development stacks available for our uh, uh, for our daily basis uses. We have Aqua Dev Desktop. We have Open Server. We have Pump Server. Somebody uses MAM Pro, but I believe that from my based on my own production experience, uh, it's not enough for enterprise uh, big projects because eventually in big projects we need profilers, debuggers, we need other automation tools, we need build systems. And in big projects we work with distributed teams when people, uh, there are newcomers, people joining and leaving the projects and as a team leaders, uh, we want to uh, unify the environments and unify the development practice. Uh, here, uh, you can see uh, planets I have found through, uh, in enterprise projects. Uh, we deal with PHP. In some projects, we deal with hip hop VM. We use Xdebug. We can use mail cachers. And actually, there are Tremendous amount of tools we use on, daily, on our daily basis uh, in our enterprise projects. So how to customize it? How to make it shareable? How to share our own experience, DevOps experience with everybody in our big teams? So I, and Puff, there is a solution for it. It's called PubFit, and it can really help us. And I can add to it before I show you a demo that it's open source. And of course, if you need, if you want even more than it provides, you can easily fork it. And that's how Drupfit, uh, fork of Pufit, uh, arrived. Actually, it's it can uh, everything uh, uh, that uh, Pufit uh, with some additional features. And what about demo? Let me show you how it's easily at this moment uh, to have VM running on your own laptop so you download VirtualBox. I do recommend installing uh, the latest version of Vagrant and VirtualBox. And it's very easy. If you, when you installed uh, Vagrant, there are a lot of pl useful plugins, especially for uh, developers, such as Vagrant Host Manager, which allows us easily to configure a host on your local environments. There is a PubFit website uh, where you can, as you can see, you can choose version of PHP you want, you can uh, choose database, you can uh, configure Xdebug, for instance, then you can download, and here uh, you download archive. If you extract it, you will find eventually Vagrant file, and so you can Vagrant app. And in addition, the config of the VM is all available in, con in JSON format. And you can easily add any number of hosts you need, any number of databases. Let's say you need RabbitMQ, you need uh, Elasticsearch, you need Apache Solar. Uh, everything is configurable here. And once you configure it, config JSON, then you can easily run your VM just using uh, Vagrant app. So. Uh, um, can you help me? Ah. So actually, there are six straightforward steps to run your VM. You can download and install VirtualBox. The next step is to install Vagrant. The next thing is to Google and download Drupal or Pufit. And you can easily customize your VM in JSON file. Then you can install useful Vagrant plugins. Uh, in Drupal page, there are notes about it. Uh, for instance, Vagrant Host Manager. And then you can just Vagrant app and have your VM running on any environment. So uh, a few notes about regarding provisioning systems. They actually uh, boost our ability to collect and share knowledge. And so we, we don't allow people in our companies to become dragons. So they sit on top of the knowledge and don't share it with other uh, or newcomers or junior developers. And it makes our lives easier to introduce 
uh, newcomers and reduces the complexity. And of course, it provides isolation of tools and isolation of environments. So we can easily have multiple number, number of VMs running on our local machine. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good. Next up, we have Michael. Not me, actually. There are other Michaels in this world. Um, his topic is continuous delivery as agile successor. Oh, and actually, can we have the slides? Yeah. Right. This is clicker. That's the clicker right here. Got it. Hello, Michael Godek. So. Uh, there's a hashtag for this talk, which is uh, go for CD, uh, F O R C D, which is also on the slide. So please post any comments and questions, and then we can continue the discussion online. And I'll start by acknowledging the inspiration for this talk, which was an article by Andrew Binstock, who's editor in chief at Dr. Dobbs. So you can see his article out there. And Jez Humble, who's the author of the book Continuous Delivery, and Martin Fowler, who's chief scientist at ThoughtWorks. So if I end up just confusing you with this, then that part's on me. So how many of you here remember the days when um, you know, software projects started out by burning up weeks and months producing some big monolithic requirements document filled with detailed and colorful flow charts and sequence diagrams, which became really increasingly irrelevant with each new line of code? You know, nobody could bring themselves to throw this stuff out, so this, we got this documentation brick that became a sort of like a fat uh, coffee cup coaster called the Little Book of Lies. So there were a lot of problems then that mature Agile teams today don't really have to deal with for the very reason that Agile steers us clear of that trouble. So um, some people seem to still enjoy sailing among the rocks, but for those of us who, with an appetite for mitigating risk, Agile came in with just the right balance of abstraction and detail to take the software industry to a new plateau. So Agile's effective, and it's become the standard of practice. Embracing change, coding in short sprints, an emphasis on automated testing and short feedback loops, all of these things lead to improvements in quality and productivity. And a decade from now, we'll still be improving on it, but the, the principal benefits reali are, are realizable today by organizations and teams that take Agile seriously. But you'll have noticed that software teams today haven't exactly run out of problems as a result of this. Right? The central problem that Agile was intended to address was the inability of software teams to adapt to changing customer requirements. So now we're getting good at adapting to change. But that really only compounds what's still one of the most intractable problems in that in the face of real ever increasing complexity and that's actually finally releasing software so continuous delivery practice intends to deal with this delivery question as agile did uh, with that of adapting to change as with agile the central focus of cd is to mitigate risk. CD was built, it's built on a foundation of DevOps practices, so that comes first. Um, con continuous integration is a cornerstone of CD, but first class software build pipelines are really the main show in continuous delivery. So Martin Fowler talked about build pipelines, what, it, what they're about. So here's his quote. One of the challenges of an automated build and test environment is you want, to build, you want your build to be fast so that you can get fast feedback, but comprehensive tests take a long time to run. A deployment pipeline is a way to deal with this by breaking up your build into stages. Each stage provides increasing confidence, usually at the cost of extra time. Early stages can find most problems yielding faster feedback, while later stages provide slower and more thorough probing. Deployment pipelines are a central part of continuous delivery. So that's the end of his quote. But still, at this point, we're still really only talking about the technical side of the delivery puzzle. 
right? We need a full stack solution. We need the whole team in on this. Uh, you don't really get to the best benefits of continuous delivery simply by automating deployment. As with Agile, we need to move culture to engage the whole team with people in less technical and non-technical roles, assuming more responsibility in the actual delivery process. The software build pipeline is where your team rehearses for delivery so that the, by the time you're ready to go out on stage and deliver, the technical issues should be resolved. One of the really great unrealized benefits of delivery automation is that it allows devs and ops to take a step back so that delivery is no longer a technical silo. Responsibility for release now belongs to the business analyst, project managers or stakeholders where it belongs. Effectively, delivery becomes a business decision instead of a technical one. This changes everything. Agile recognizes that when stakeholders first see working software, it changes their perception of requirements. So now we don't go and burn the budget before we show them something. In delivery practice, once release becomes a business decision, it profoundly changes stakeholders' perception of process, which implies a potential for a much richer customer relationship and the opportunities to take the software industry to a whole new level. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have Stella talking about something D8 in 8, which will tell ourselves what, what that is about. Hi, everyone. So as Michael said, my name is Stella. Um, I'm from a Drupal agency in Ireland called Anertech. And as some of you might have found out this week, we recently launched our website, anertech.com, in Drupal 8. So one of the things that we did in preparation for that was we ran an internal competition, which we called D8 in 8. So the aim of the competition was to get the entire team familiar with Drupal 8, whether they be a front-end developer, back-end developer, project manager, it didn't matter. We wanted everybody downloading Drupal 8, playing around with it, contributing to Drupal Core, contributing to Contrib as well, and uh, yeah, to have some fun along the way as well. So the, how the project was run was that everybody, keeping in with the eight team here now, everybody was given eight weeks to complete their project. It didn't matter what it was. It could be building a website. It could be porting a module, working on patches. As long as it was something to do with Drupal 8, that was okay by us. At the end of the eight weeks, we got the entire team together, and they were each given eight minutes to present on what they had done. There is no judging panel, per se. Everybody who participated was given eight points to distribute as they wished. So if they thought one person did a particularly amazing job, they could give all of their eight points to that person. Or if they thought that there was a few deserving projects, they could split it up between them as they wished. So what did we learn from all of this? Well, we definitely gained a lot more familiarity with Drupal 8, both in terms of downloading it, getting it to work, um, playing around with it, site building, messing around in the code. Um, we also learned how to deploy Drupal 8 websites, in particular learning about the whole new configuration management tool, which is just completely awesome. Um, but the key takeaway was uh, it really showed us how we could get our team involved in contributing to Drupal Core. And that was very important to us. So here are some of the things that we achieved. Uh, one of our developers, Anthony, built a fancy photo gallery site, complete with a custom light box style overlay. So you could click on the image, it would pop up in the light box, and then for extra bonus points, he added a a buy print button and integrated it with the Relax payment gateway, which is a, a popular payment gateway in Ireland. Um, another developer, Mark, created a fully responsive multilingual video site. Uh, I think he was embedding YouTube videos on that. But as with our, any Irish Drupal initiative, it wouldn't be complete without some trivia. So uh, Tommy uh, created a trivia game based on uh, custom entities with some Node.js for a really slick user interface. However, who won 
That's what you all want to know, right? So I'm pleased to announce that uh, your friendly volunteer and entertainer, Andrew McPherson, uh, won the competition. He got a number of commits into Drupal Core, including knocking out a field API beta blocker. He ported not one, but three modules to Drupal 8, as well as creating a brand new one. So uh, well done, Andrew. Did we have fun and contribute code? I think the answer to that is definitely yes. We certainly learned an awful lot. Uh, there is admittedly not without a fair amount of hair pulling. I have to remember this was about six months ago that I think when we started this, certainly during the summer. Um, so we were working with you know, earlier versions of the Alpha Drupal 8. Things weren't quite as ready as we had hoped. Um, there was certainly a lack of documentation and, and nothing on Doodle was returning what we wanted. Um, but we, we had fun along the way. Would we do it again? Absolutely. Especially now that there's a beta blocker out, uh, I think it might be a fair game for everybody else to get in on this. So I would highly encourage you to all, in, whether within your organization, within your local community group, run a, a Drupal 8 and 8 uh, competition. It's a great way to get involved with the community, to give back, and to learn Drupal 8 along the way. Just the keep with the team, all the eights. So eight hours, eight minutes, eight days, whatever it is, that's the general theme. If you want to find out more, check out our blog post on anertech.com or uh, come find me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Now we even have better one, so it's actually easier to upgrade websites because that was one of the big issues before. Good, the next one we have um, Jesus Manuel, which will talk about a Drupal 8 console, which is not Rush. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna talk about a project called Drupal, Drupal 8 console, and let's see. The main purpose of this project is to take advantage of the Symfony console component in order to provide a CLI tool to generate Drupal 8 modules and take care of other recurring tasks. Okay, and the best way to explain this is showing you this little video. I'm gonna play here. Okay, I'm listing you. There's no, there's no any module. I'm gonna start generating a new, a new um, Drupal 8 module. So just go something like this. And start asking me a few questions. What will be the module name? What will be the module pro? I mean the module project name. Then what will be the path where this module will generate it. I can add any description I want to. From there, it's gonna start asking me all the few questions. Like we should, what package name, or the version. If I wanna generate a controller, I say no. The whole directory is structure. And once I finish the generation, we will see, we will execute a three command. We will see all these files will generate it. The info file, the module file. So now let's go ahead and generate a new controller. Same thing, now it's gonna ask me which will be the module that I want this, this controller get generated. So I'm gonna say DrupalCon, which is the one I just created the controller name, I want to add service, I want to need a service, confirm generation, yes. And now we can see there's a new file here, and also the routing file is also generated. Yeah, let's go ahead and create a new, any other component. Let's say how about generate a form, and don't get bored, we'll see how it looks executing, just for now. Let's say default form, it's fine. I know, let's say event form. The ID is gonna set as default, I don't want any service. Generate a structure, and I say yes, it's gonna start asking me for adding a fields for the form. Let's say I'm gonna I want to add a new field called event name, which will be the field type, and this, uh, this by default is text field, so I just hit enter. Let's choose another name, something like, it's always hard getting a new name, right? So event, oh, come on. Yeah, city, that will be a good one. Let's say uh, text, which is fine, but I can, use arrows for auto completion and see all of the field types that I can add. And let's end up adding a new different kind of, uh, I mean, file type, field type. So in this case, it's a date time. So I'm gonna update route yes. From here, I can see there's a new, new PHP file added. Let's, let's try go ahead and, and enable this, this new module that I just created. Say enable drush en, then, and then let's see how, how this looks in code and how it looks in, 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 when I'm running it. So what was generated, what the info YAML file was generated with the info that I just entered. You can see the name and also 
the dot module file, which is implementing two hooks, help and team hook. And also this default controller what you're in, the proper directory, well adding the namespace, the use statement was added, this controller is extending the controller arrays, and also this little action, hello action was added. And this, as you can see, also the route register, I mean was registered, it, the route and also is pointing to the controller that will be executed. This means if I go something like DrupalCon, hello, Drupal, I will see something like this happening. I can see it's reading the parameter that I'm passing from the argument. I can change that and see how it's, it's been updated. But how, that, that's how the controller works. Let's see how the form generation part works. It also generates a path for you, a routing, and in this case it's pointing to the full class, which is a form class. We can see same thing, namespace is added, the user statement, the class extending, you know, form base. And remember the fields that I asked me to add, CD text, event name text, I mean event date as a date field. And also takes care of adding a submission, submit form method, and also it takes care of getting all the values that the user input, I mean enter on the form and store in the configuration system. You will see how it works. Then form is here. And I'm just set the values. HTML, uh, we have HTML5 here as a date, uh, saving, and if I copy and paste this path and open it in a new tab, I will see the values are here because I just set it on the, on the submission form and I'm just getting when I'm rendering the form. Well, what else we can do from here? Let me go ahead and generate a new plugin block. Let's go ahead and accept all defaults. I don't want to create a form. Just generate a new thing and it takes care of the same thing, adding the proper class in the proper directory, adding all the namespaces. In the particular case of block, adding the annotation for letting know Drupal, this is a block. And at the beginning, the, the, the project was most generators, but now we are adding a few other features, like let's how about enlisting all the routes registered on the running system. You can use something like this. If you want a detail of a route, you can specifically pass as a parameter. You will see all the details of the route. And you can also do the same thing for the container, listing all of the services living in the service container. And the, what else we have? Gener command generators, control generators, entity config, gener I mean, config, entity config, entity content. There's like plugin blocks, image blocks. We can generate services. There's little thing more you can do. How can I get from here? Where you can find this project? You can find it here, drupal.org slash project console. Or if you don't have a Drupal account, and you have a GitHub account, it's etchin Drupal slash Drupal app project, Drupal app console, sorry. And who started this, just to finish it, uh, started this project with David Flores, another developer from uh, Mexico, and myself, I'm Jesus Manuel Olivas, Twitter account is J-M-O-L-I-V-A-S, but you can even blame this guy for this project. <laughs> Actually, we discussed, we're talking with Larry, David and myself, at Drupal Camp Costa Rica about, you know, which new tools from Symfony can be integrated in Drupal 8, and one of the topics was like, how about the Drupal, I mean, how about the Symfony console component? And we just, from there, we start working on the project, it was last year, so. What else we have, what's out of the box, is what I showed you, generate modules, info files, it takes care of registering the, I mean, registering the routes, and the YAML files, even services. Take care of creating classes, putting on the right directory, setting all the user statements that you need to, setting all the, I mean, making this class extend this other class like that, and how about no, no scaffolding or generators? What I told you, you can listing routes and listing um, services, living in service container, and who can benefit of using this tool? Module maintainers can create and migrate your current contribute modules to Drupal 8, Drupal trainers and consultants can take advantage of this in order to train people and teach how Drupal 8 works. And obviously Drupal shop can, can reduce the time of developing Drupal 8 modules, and I think it's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, so obviously the question is, as I said before, is there a Drush integration? There's not, but I was, okay. Okay, the question is, if it is Drush integration, there's not currently a Drush integration, but I was talking to a developer yesterday, and we were, actually we have an issue on the project, and he showed me how to do that, so probably we'll have an issue, in, I mean, Drush integration any soon. So you can do something like Drush console, but since console you can run Drush, you can do like something like Drush console, Drush console. You can, <laughs> Thank you. So, we're already the last one. Last person is Lee, and he will tell, tell us about security. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Lee Kelsey, and online I'm known as Amstercad. I'm thrilled to have joined the Core Migrate module team this week, and Friday we'll be helping everyone at the sprints all day. We want everyone to join us at the sprints we, we want so everyone can comfortably ease into the process of using Drupal.org as a tool to perform the work required to release Drupal 8, especially after everyone returns back home. Everyone can learn what they can do to help Friday at the sprints. Just show up. But these are the lightning talks, and I'm here to raise a few security questions now here at DrupalCon Amsterdam 2014 for us to consider and discuss. Why does it take so long for people who maintain distributions of Drupal to update modules with security updates that have otherwise been available on Drupal.org for many, many weeks already? What can be done to push all security updates faster and with more reliability through the distribution chain? What should developers using these distributions do about the problem? How many of you can relate to the problem as I've tried to describe it? Great. Pleased to see that. So clearly, we need to improve how distributions are actually distributed if we plan to further develop our secure business processes using continuous integration. This is a simple problem that needs to be fixed. Otherwise, the value of using a distribution is greatly diminished, especially by less technical developers that are not so familiar with Drupal.org and security. I can be reached at Drupal.org's contact form, and my username is Amstercad. That's spelled Amster, like Amsterdam, then Charlie Apple David, Amstercad. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So if you're worried about distribution security, talk to Lee. He's also available tomorrow. OK, that's it. Um, that was the lightning talks. Um, we had um, seven speakers, and I really talked to them. That, uh, really thanked them that they took the time to prepare something in really super short notice. Um, if you really liked what we did today in the last hour, um, tell us via the contact form, fill, uh, well, the survey form. So fill it out. Um, either directly feedback to the speakers, we will, or I will forward it, or to the Lightning Talks itself, and we'll see if we're going to continue doing that and other cons and camps. Now I wish you a really nice day. Enjoy the last session day, and please all make sure that you come to the closing keynote. I heard there will be announcements, interesting videos and stuff where we go next year in Europe. Enjoy it. Bye.